Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Podcast Series. My name is Scott Miller. I serve as your host and interviewer each week. As you may know, I'm also the author of several books, including Franklin Covey's newest release from HarperCollins' Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds. I kind of call it the modern day chicken soup for the leadership soul, where I was privileged to identify 30 of our first guests and write a different chapter about each of them based on a what I call transformational insight. The book is out now and available both in audio, digital, print, and soon to be video. And I've just completed the manuscript for Master Mentors Volume 2, where I identify 30 new mentors and 30 new guests on our way to 10 volumes in the series. Today, our guest is Dr. Ruth Gautien, one of the most renowned coaches and mentors around the science of high performance. She is the chief learning officer at the Weill Cornell Medical School in New York City and the author of the new release, The Success Factor, Developing the Mindset and Skill Set for Peak Business Performance. Dr. Gautian, welcome to On Leadership. Hello, hello. So nice to be here with you. You gave me permission to call you Ruth. We are friends and we met in the MG100, which of course is Marshall Goldsmith's remarkable collection of smart people plus Scott Miller, and I'm delighted that we actually were able to have you on today because of your book tour. You are everywhere. There is nowhere you're not right now, whether it be on uh, uh, television, radio, podcast, in print, and digital columns. We're honored to have some of your time today, Dr. Gautian. Let's talk a little bit about what your path has been to write this book that is now becoming a bestseller on Amazon, The Success Factor. Today, we're going to talk about all things related to high performers how to know if you are one, how to become one, how to recruit one, how to retain and engage one in your organization. Ruth, why don't you take some time and reorient yourselves to our viewers and listeners around your path academically, professionally. You've earned, of course, a doctorate in the topic as well. And then we'll dive into the topics of today's book. Sure. I am so excited to be here with you today to really geek out with you about success, which is probably my favorite topic in the world because I never believed that anybody wants to be average in life. I really thought people want to be successful, but didn't always know how to do it. So at the age of 43, while working full time and raising my family, I decided to go back to school, get my doctorate and really take a deep dive into success. And I haven't stopped since I've been studying Nobel prize winners and astronauts and Olympic champions. And my job is really to make people successful. And when they succeed, I succeed. And that's why I geek out about it. That's why whenever I talk about success, you will just see me getting all animated. Ruth, the book is really quite profound. It really is a foundation drawn from a lot of your lifelong research, the work you've done, of course, on earning your doctorate. You now are a chief learning officer, part of, like I said, the Marshall Goldsmith 100, one of the most renowned coaches. You're an expert on mentoring. I actually recently watched and joined your LinkedIn learning course on how to be a great mentor, how to find a mentor. It's actually excellent. Just Google Ruth Gautian and she'll come up, I, I assure you. What I'd like to do today, Ruth, is really talk about what makes a high performer? You know, How do you define that? How do we know if we are one? And you've got three kind of commonalities that I want to dive deep in today. Uh, that they have a strong work ethic, they have a strong yep. foundation, and they're a lifelong learner. We'll get into that in a few moments, if you will. Talk about why you chose to dedicate this book around high performers, and how do you define someone that's a high performer? Yeah, you know, I, I always felt that high performers, that's something for other people, people who were born into the right families, had the right pedigree. But then I started working and being around high performers, and I really noticed how they do things differently. And it was at that point that I realized that hmm, maybe we can actually learn how to do this. And I actually first did research to define success, because believe it or not, we don't have a common definition of it. And what I have learned is that success, the definition changes based on who you ask, but it's also a moving target. But the definition that I used for the success factor and for all my research on success was that people, these were people who created a shift in the way we do things, in the way we process things, in the way we think about things. That's number one. Number two, they're recognized for their work. And number three, as they start to ascend, they bring other people up with them because they fully understand that a spotlight 
on someone else does not detract from the spotlight on them. And they very often do that through mentoring, either one-on-one or huge group. So that was my definition of success that I used in the success factor. Hey, beautifully said, Dr. Covey, our founder, would have called it having an abundance mentality, recognizing that you know scarcity will ex- expose you quickly as not a That's competent right. leader, as not a person with an abundance mindset. Although I call it high performers. In the book, you call it high achievers. Perhaps we'll use those words um, interchangeably today. Ruth, I was recently a guest on a podcast when I was promoting my book, Master Mentors, that highlights 30 people that have been on our podcast that I think have transformational insights. And I was asked once what the common thread was amongst these 30 people. This was yeah. the, the host asked me this, and I thought for a half a second, and I said, they work harder than everybody else. They're hard workers. And he, and he, and he, he pushed on me, and he said, well, that's kind of insulting. I mean, really, all that differentiates them? I said, no, there's more than that, but I firmly believe that there's no such thing as overnight success. There's overnight fame, but there's no such thing as overnight success. That's if there right. is, it's usually fleeting and ill-gotten. And he pushed on me and he said, no, really, isn't there more? And I said, well, there is more, but the first thing that I think makes a common thread amongst people and master mentors is they just work harder than everybody else. And then he kept pushing me and he said, well, actually, I, kind that, I find that kind of offensive. He said, you're telling me my father who sold vegetables from the back of his truck his whole life just needed to work harder. And I said, well, I've not met your father, so I don't know if your father had the right vegetables or the right truck or he had a big enough truck or he had a big enough sign or was in the right corner. I don't know what your dad's passions and fears and talents were. But what I am telling you is I do believe that hard work is a differentiator. And we might define that differently. He dragged it out for 15 more minutes and kind of kept pushing me. And I thought, well, it's your podcast and I can hold my own. But it's interesting (laughs) that one of the ways in which you identify high achievers is that they, in fact, have a strong work ethic. That's right. Would you expand on that and talk about why that's maybe perhaps not a fleeting competency, but it's still relevant in, you know, working smarter than working harder. It's it's still relevant in AI and in machine automation and digital. Why is a strong work ethic a key contributor to being a high achiever. That's right. And Scott, I will back you up because you are definitely onto something. They do have that strong work ethic. They do work harder, but it's not about putting 18 hour days in, right? Because trust me, those right. fi- hour 15 is not as yeah. productive as hour one. So what it is, is about working smarter, not just harder. They understand their peak performance hours or what I what I choose to call their cognitively focused hours when they are sharper and they can get more done during that time than they can the rest of the day. So for example, I'm a morning person. I wake up super early. That is when I do my most focused work, right? My writing, my editing, things that take a lot of concentration. I don't do that type of work in the afternoon when I'm slower. I say what it's called my passive tasks, the Zooms, the emails, the phone calls, things that don't take deep concentration. So instead of doing deep focus work, some people block it out on their calendar during remnants of time. They don't do it that way. They structure that deep focus work for their peak focus hours. And then they do their passive tasks during those other hours. That's number one. The other part about working harder is also how they approach challenges. They approach challenges differently than the rest of us. So, for example, they never question if they will overcome a challenge. They know that they will. They have confidence that they'll overcome the challenge. Instead, they focus on how. What is the strategy that I have not thought of yet? And when you start to focus on how instead of if, that's a whole different shift in the mindset. Now it becomes possible because now you're just looking for the strategies and it's not dependent on anyone else except for you. So when they work harder, when you say they work harder, that's true, but they work differently at how they work harder. And it's also very much dependent on how they view challenges because high achievers, they fear not trying more than they fear failing. That is the most important part. Every failure, they know it's coming, but they say, what can I learn from this? What is the lesson I have here from this experience? And they keep trying over and over again. They don't fear failure. They don't fear success. They fear not trying more than they fear failing. 
Ruth, nicely said, I like your focus on kind of knowing what Dan Pink wrote about in his book, When, which is when is your trough, your, your peak, your trough, and your recovery. He didn't invent that, but he popularized it in his book. Yeah. I think it's so important for all high achievers, high performers, all of us to know when is our peak. Like you, my peak is 4 a.m. to about 11 a.m. And then I get into a bit of a trough between 11 and about one or so. I have a bit of a recovery between one and three. And then, you know, the three miniature Scott Millers in my house drag me to death's door till about 7.30 where I crash into bed every night. It's interesting this We are morning, quite similar. <laughs> yeah, we are similar. Um, and not in many ways, including your academic rigor and intellect. But <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, uh, like many people, Ruth, I do my best thinking in the shower. And it's just this morning, prior to our interview, I was in the shower and my wife, Stephanie, was girding her loins for the day to corral the three miniature Scott Millers that are in our home who are named Thatcher, Smith, and Wentworth. And I said to Stephanie, when the shower is running, I was in the shower, she was out. I said, you know, I'm interviewing someone today that's quite profound. I said, and I told her who you were and how I knew you. And I said, you know, one of the premises that Dr. Ruth, we'll call you that, <laughs> different topic, but no less <laughs> interesting. Um, Whole other episode. <laughs> a different episode. I said, one of her concepts around high achievers is that they tend to have a flywheel. We're all familiar with Jim Collins' work in Good to Great and Built to Last around the hedgehog effect and the flywheel, that they tend to get great around one thing. In fact, you can, you can recognize that most of our 200 guests have defined expertise in marketing and great questioning, sales skills, communication, body language, empathy. You know, they're known for something. Now, you have outliers yeah. like Matthew McConaughey or things like that, right? They're known for other things. And I said to Stephanie... Dr. Ruth, as I call you now, as of right now, I said, she's really <laughs> pressing on me because as I build my own brand as a high achiever, part of, I think, what is one of my frustrations is that I have some expertise in leadership, obviously, 25 years in a leadership firm and marketing, 10 years as a CMO and a couple years as a host and podcaster, as a mentor. And I think part of my challenge is that I've got a little bit of expertise in like six or eight things. And I'm not sure that the world, the audience knows where to segment me, talk about the value of Flywheel, of becoming a thought leader in a particular area of competence and how you build that towards being a high achiever. Long intro, but take as long as you'd like on that. So I'm um, fascinated that, um, you know, that you talked about thinking in the shower at the beginning, which is true because when we're most relaxed is when we get most creative, hmm. which is why on walks, which is why in the shower, just as why during the coffee breaks at conferences is when we have that those ideas just percolating. But you're right. The high achievers are known for something in particular, and it took them a while to figure out what that was. So for example, Apollo Anton Ono, who is the most decorated winter Olympian. If you remember, he's that short track sure, I think he lives here skater. in Utah. I think he actually lives here in Utah. Uh, that I don't know, but he has you know that big bandana. He used yeah. to go around super yeah, fast in yeah. circles. Um, and he was also the mirror ball champion on Dancing with the Stars. But before all of that, he was actually a state champion swimmer. Hmm. So he was really good at it. He had that talent. But he told me that he didn't enjoy it. He didn't love it. But he loved everything about short track speed skating. So much that he left home at 14, where he was raised by a single dad, and went all the way to Lake Placid to train with people and live with people who are a few years his senior. But that's because he loved it. And he figured out what that was. So a lot of these people, it took them a while before they figured out what it is that they love doing. But once they figured it out, they just couldn't stop. So another story is Dr. Bob Lefkowitz, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2012. He was a physician. He was going to be a cardiologist. That's what he thought he was going to do. And he is a cardiologist, but he hasn't seen patients in many years because during the Vietnam War, you can either go to war or if you're a physician or a scientist, you can go work in the public health service. In his case, that was at the National Institutes of Health. Well, that is where everything happened because he fell in love with science during that time. And once he started, he just couldn't stop. And it's a good thing that he didn't because it got him all the way to the Nobel Prize. But these people tried many different things before they figured out 
what it is that they love to do. And I think that's why, while the book talks about four things that all high achievers do, and I tell everyone you have to do all four things in tandem, but it starts with figuring out what your passion is. Because once you figure that out, you are going to be a thought leader in that field. And what is a thought leader? That is what people come to you for, what you have an expertise in. And that's one of the reasons that I take people through a passion audit, which is one of the things that that's included in the book, because it's so important to figure that out. And just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you enjoy doing it. So it's okay to try a few things out. And in your case, you were doing different things before and each time you refined it and then you became a thought leader in a different field because you went all in. When you were doing it, you went all in and you became a thought leader in that. So I, you're doing the right thing. I often Keep talk going. that you cannot define yourself as a thought leader. In fact, you write about this. Someone else has to call you a thought leader. We'll let the record That's show. Right. Dr. Ruth has now called me a thought leader. We're not quite sure what yet, but stand by. I'll let you know. It's Ruth, official. It's, it's what? <laughs> it's official now. It's official. We're not quite sure in what topic, but stand by. Um, we're going to come back to the first, which is the mindset. But you let's put a bow on strong work ethic. Yeah. I can't reinforce this enough because there's a difference between being efficient and being effective. There's That's a difference right. between you know, spending 15 hours where there's diminishing return when you're not at your best. That's right. What I have found is when we interview people like John Gray, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup for the Soul series, uh, John Gordon, John Maxwell, these people are insanely hard workers. They yep. are speaking at conferences, they're taping four or five podcasts a day, they're writing more books. Now you might say some of them are perhaps addicted to that, but I actually think what they do is they differentiate themselves, not just through competence, but through work ethic. And I yep. think that's something that should not be lost in today's topic. Let's go to second or third, perhaps. We'll come back to mindset, I wanna finish with that. Is strong, strong foundation, high achievers have a strong foundation, riff on that. That's right. So this, it's a strong foundation, which they are constantly reinforcing. What they did early in their career, they do later in their career. Ask any athlete, and they'll tell you that any warm-up they do before the NBA games, before the Olympics, are the same warm-ups that you would see in any junior high gym. Just the professional athletes have better equipment and better sneakers, but the warm-ups are exactly the same. Now, it's not just for athletes. It's in every other industry as well. One of the people who I interviewed for the success factor is Neil Katyal. Neil Katyal argued 45 cases before the Supreme Court, more than any other minority lawyer in America. Most lawyers don't have one case. He's had 45. And I said, Neil, how do you prepare for these cases? And he said, Ruth, I do three things. First, I prepare a binder with every question that I might get asked and I figure out the answers for each one of those questions. And I walk into court and put that binder on the table in front of me. Ruth, I've never opened up that binder, but just preparing it prepared me for the case. That's the first thing he's done. The second thing he's done is that he, he creates moot courts. Moot courts are simulated cases, if you will. And he said he did 15 of them when he first started arguing before the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. And now for his 45th case, he does five moot court cases. The point is he never stopped doing it just because he's so experienced. He is reinforcing his foundation. And the third thing, and, and you're a dad, you'll get this. When he puts his kids to bed, instead of a good night story, they get to hear the opening arguments for the case before the Supreme Court. Because Neil told me if a child can understand, the court will understand. And he has done that for every single one of the 45 cases. He didn't stop just because he was so experienced at doing it. And that is what's meant by a strong foundation, which is constantly being reinforced. That's so ironic because our bedtime is just like that. <laughs> oh wait, it's nothing like that. In fact, just last week, I went to bed around 8.30 and all three boys had done something outrageous. And my wife, Stephanie, walked them up and. I literally laid in bed as if I was a judge and I heard each case and I actually listened to the <laughs> evidence and then I prescribed what their state was, guilty or innocent or some <laughs> education. Literally, I laid in bed and sentenced them all 
<laughs> and none of that worked. Okay, so strong work ethic, strong foundation. Let's just talk about lifelong learning. Seems like a little bit of a trite concept, right? We understand the uh -huh. concept, but take it a bit deeper. What differentiates these strong, high achievers from others through lifelong learning? That's right. So you've heard of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Mark Cuban. They are known, they are notorious for reading three to eight hours a day. But it's not reading that made them billionaires. It's actually being open to new knowledge, learning different things that are not familiar to them. And then they start making connections yeah. between points that other people haven't seen yet or they take something from one industry and use it in a slightly different way in another industry. That is what made them so successful. It was not the reading for three to eight hours a day. It was opening up their mind to new knowledge. So while reading extensively might work for Gates and Buffett and Cuban, there are other ways that you can open your mind up for new knowledge to new knowledge. So it could be books, it could be articles, it could be LinkedIn learning courses. Thank you, Scott, for watching my course. It could be um, podcasts, it could be webinars. I mean, hopefully we're talking about some great stuff here. It could be um, uh, TED Talks. There's so many different ways that you can learn new things. You just have to open your mind to it. And one of the ways that you can also learn new things, in addition to all of that, is by talking to people and talking to interesting people, especially to people who think differently than you. And in fact, every single one of these high achievers surrounded themselves, not with one, but with a team of mentors who believed in them more than they believe in themselves. And that really, really got them out of those challenging times. So don't just have one mentor, have a team of mentors and figure out the way that you like to learn best. You don't have to sit in the classroom and just absorb, absorb that new knowledge. Dr. Ruth, I think that is profound and difficult, especially in 2022, where most of us have gone through some kind of political upheaval in our lives whether it be because we voted for this candidate or against that candidate in the last U.S. election. It's caused, in some cases, enormous discord in families. I mean, politics in America has never been more vitriolic, and there's no sign that that's letting up. And it's actually hurting relationships and friendships and collegiality. And I think it's difficult, is it not, to... It's becoming more difficult to have people in your life who perhaps see things differently than you or disagree because there's such discord, I think, and you're really saying it's now more important than ever. Yeah. If you're going to become a high achiever to associate with and friend people who see the world differently, perhaps voted against a person that you couldn't possibly know, reinforce that point around why it's probably harder than ever, but may perhaps more important than ever. Look, if everyone looks like you and sounds like you and thinks like you, Don't we wish. how are you going to be oh, innovative? Oh, yeah. right. How will you be innovative? You need to learn new things. And by surrounding yourself yeah. with different people, with people who just think about different ideas, think about problems differently, but it's also maybe in whatever industry they are in, they solve the problem that you are currently facing. So just like Buffett and Warren and, and Cuban, uh, you can, um, Warren Buffett and Mark Cuban and Bill Gates, you can take ideas switch them just a little bit and put them in your industry and solve a problem. No need to reinvent yeah. the wheel yeah. if someone else already solved it. So it's not about fighting people and standing your ground. It's really about hearing different things. You're storing it in your brain. You never know when you might need to pull out that information. Reminds me of our mutual friend, Dory Clark, who recently wrote the book, The Long Game, How to Be yes. a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. She talks a lot about how to twist on an existing idea, not everyone needs to be inventing from the ground up. Okay, That's strong right. work ethic, strong foundation, lifelong learning. Before those, the first you would call is, it's their mindset. At Franklin Covey, we call it their paradigm, your belief system. Talk about the importance of how your mindset sets you up to be a high achiever. That's right. These are the people, these high achievers, they've got this fire in their belly. This is something they would do for free if they could. This is what they were put on this earth 
It's why they wake up in the morning with the bounce and they cannot quiet their mind at night because they're thinking about this. They are so passionate about it. And they'll tell you they would do it for free if they could. This is what we call in adult learning intrinsic motivation. It comes from within. And it's that fire in the belly that we need to figure out how to pour gasoline on that to keep that flame burning. Now, this is different from extrinsic motivation, the diplomas, the awards, the recognitions. Now, I don't know about you, but those things are when other people judge you. And if other people are going to judge you, that is really, really hard to sustain. And those are usually the people who burn out or fail out. And if it was all about the medal, they would have quit as soon as they got it. But I don't know of a single Nobel Prize winner who quit doing science just because they won the Nobel. It has to come from within. So for example, think about if you know somebody who really likes science and they have a family member who suffered from cancer. And most of us know someone who has gone through that devastating disease. They want to dedicate their lives to finding a treatment so that nobody else needs to suffer like that person. So every time they're faced with a challenge, they're still, they're not going to quit and start binging Netflix. They're still going to work at it because they know any advancement that they make, no matter how small, will help in the long run, even if someone else can build on it. This is why, this is their life's purpose. This is why they do it. This is what they're thinking about all the time. And sure, I just gave an example of a scientist, but it works in any other industry. It's why we do the work that we do. And once we see it, we can't unsee it. Ruth, pivot now to the conversation aimed at leaders, formal leaders who are yeah. responsible inside their organization for recruiting and retaining talent. Yeah. Uh, I think it was a week ago that I saw where, I think it was Ariana Huffington that first renamed the great resignation as the great reevaluation. I'm gonna credit her yeah. with it for a moment. And then since then I've seen it called 15 things, right? So we all know right. what we're talking about. We're talking about feeling valued inside your yep. employer with That's challenging right. work, with a respectful environment where you can bring your passion, your talents and your fears and your whole body, your whole self, your whole life, who yeah. you are and help the organization achieve their goals while you achieve yours. Everybody's values have shifted since the pandemic. That's I don't know right. anybody who hasn't, right? We were all in the same storm. We weren't all in the same boat, so to speak. Um, what would you say to leaders whose high achievers are being poached by the hour? Every yeah. high achiever who's on LinkedIn is getting multiple overtures a day. In yes. some cases, they're getting multiple offers a day because yes. money is free, thanks to the Federal Reserve, and every company <laughs> is sitting on a lot of cash, and they can afford to swoop in and poach your high performers that you've worked painstakingly to develop, and they can pay them 30 40 50% more in a heartbeat. Talk yep. specifically to what leaders and companies should be doing to retain and engage they're high achievers. You're right. And I think I would challenge that with, have you developed your high achievers? Mm -hmm. So think about the performance appraisals that we have in the workplace, right? So let's say you scale on one to five with three being average and five being best. If you're employee, if you're the employee that gets three, you are meeting expectations. Thank you very much for your service. See you again next year. If you're a four or five, that means you are exceeding expectations. Thank you very much. Doing great work. See you next year. Now, what happens if you fall below average, below that three? Oh, that's when things really start to happen. You get a corrective action plan with milestones that you need to hit. They send you to courses and workshops so that you can get better at certain skills. And there's a supervisor who comes to check in on you and hold you accountable to these things. Now, if this is the attention we're giving to the low achievers, don't we have this a little lopsided? What if we gave that same attention and those resources to the high potentials, the fours, and the high achievers, the five? Imagine the kind of work they can do if you approach them and said, I know you're really loving this. What's a skill that you want to get better at? What can I do to help? Is there a course or workshop that you think would be helpful? Can I send you to that? Imagine how that would feel. Now I feel valued. You actually see my work. 
Now you're going to start giving me credit for my work and not have someone else take credit for my work. You want to give them the flexibility within certain boundaries to do the work. Nobody likes to be micromanaged, especially high achievers. Now, who do you think their friends are? Like attracts like. So their friends are other high achievers. They can be your best recruiters. Now, if you don't start giving them attention, this is actually very dangerous because they are going to leave and it is no problem for them to leave right now. And what are you as a leader going to be left with? At best, average employees. At worst, below average employees. So we need to really start reimagining how we are dealing with the high potentials and the high achievers and maybe start giving them some more recognition and some more opportunities. Ruth, as we end our time today, thank you for that as well. What are some of the other big ideas in your research and your work as the chief learning officer of a world-renowned medical institution and school? What are some other ideas you'd like our listeners and viewers to take away today that have been so passionate about this book and your life's work? It really started with guidance that I received from my mentor, Dr. Bert Shapiro, which was later reinforced when I interviewed Dr. Fauci. My mentor said to me when I was starting my research on this, he said, do something important, not just interesting. And those words have really resonated with me. And when I asked Dr. Fauci which projects he selects, he said, I do things that are important, not just interesting. Because if it's interesting, it's a hobby and it's interesting to you. But if it's important, it will have an impact. And if it has an impact, it will have a ripple effect. And if we want to leave this world a little better than we found it, we have to start working on making a positive impact. So I challenge every single listener, what is something you can do that's important, not just interesting, so that you can leave an impact on the world as well? Dr. Ruth Gautian, you're on a whirlwind book tour right now. Your book has launched in both uh, the UK and the US. It is the success factor, developing the mindset and skill set for peak business performance. Thanks for joining us. You're a, a beacon of light. You're contagiously positive, not to mention you got academic street cred as well, too. Thanks for joining us, Ruth. Everybody check out your mentoring session on LinkedIn Learning. And Ruth, we appreciate your time today. Thanks for investing and pouring into all of our listeners. Thank you so much. I was so excited to chat with you. And we'll see you back here next week for a new guest on leadership. <laughs>